Well, good morning, saints of God. My deep love to you. Um, such mutual love poured out to me this week as my dad went to glory uh, in glorious fashion. He had a beautiful finish. Got saved at 86, went to be with Jesus at 87. This Saturday at 2 o'clock, we'll have his memorial service for any who know him and would like to be a part of that. You're all invited. We did have our uh, meeting this morning, our church meeting, and you know, during COVID and all that went on, just one of the things that overwhelmed me was how do you hit budget when something like that comes? And we didn't just hit budget, we went over it. So thank you for all your faithfulness and that and every need that came up that we were aware of this body met financially to help each other in our journey and prayers and meals and helping the older people. It was an unbelievable year to watch the love of Christ be poured out. So pastor loves you so much. Hillary Osborne, wave. She's been battling cancer and she gets to be with us in worship. Did Cheryl have to go home or is she still Cheryl? It's been one year since Cheryl's been able to come worship with us. And so we rejoice and having our dear sister back. And did Claire make it again this week? Claire Heller? Oh, that's... So Lazarus is in that building. <laughs> she should not be here, and God had a different plan. Thank you. It's glorious to have you here worshiping with us. So let's uh, pray, and we will open up the Word of God. And I just want to remind you again that this is, this is worship, and so we're going to continue to worship God through his um, inspired word of God and declared word of God. So let's join our hearts together and worship as the people of God over what you're going to, you're going to love what we're going to look at today. Father, I thank you for this glorious gospel, your gospel, the gospel of a saving God of sinners. And I, I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God for salvation. Lord, we love it, we treasure it, and I pray this morning that you would bless the saints of God as they look into these truths. I pray if there are any in our midst who have never been born from above, God, that this would be their day of visitation, or that you would open eyes and you would let them see Christ as a treasure hidden in a field, and this morning they would sell all that they might have this Christ. God, move in power. Through your word we pray, for your glory alone. Amen. Turn to Romans chapter 6. We've been studying the gospel of Romans for a year. Good news is, three more. <laughs> Just a brief setting of the context again. This is a gospel of salvation. It's a gospel about salvation from sin and its consequences that came through Adam and death spread to all men. We've been separated from God and in Romans 1, the wrath of God is upon us. We're stillborns. We come into this world separated and under his, his judgment and his justice. And we, we need a gospel to bring us out from under that and bring us back to God. Romans 1 through 5 is the salvation of sin's penalty. And we learned and we studied and we labored that there's a way for sinners to be justified before God. Where the God of the universe looks at you and says, not guilty. I declare you right. Right in my standing and right in my presence. And the only way he can do that is through the work of Jesus Christ. By what he came and did by fulfilling the law in your place. And by dying the penalty of the law in your place. But now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and you now can stand before God justified. Smile. You're justified before God. Romans 6 through 8. God's going to sanctify you now as a child of God. He's going to grow you. And what we're studying now is that you have not just been saved from sin's penalty, but from its rule. And when you were in Adam, you were under the rule and dominion of sin. And God has brought you out from under that rule and reign. And he's going to begin changing and transforming you into the image of Christ until that last day 
when you're going to be saved from the presence of sin, saved to sin no more. That's where all this is headed. You're done with sin completely. You're done with its guilt. You're done with its rule. And one day you're going to be done with his presence. It'll never afflict you again for all of eternity. That's what Romans is about. And he finishes it with to God be the glory for such a salvation as this. So the question Paul is answering now in Romans 6. Can I just live any way I want? Now that I'm justified, let me sin that grace might abound. Let me just keep living it up and enjoy sin because God gets glory by forgiving me of my sin because of Romans 5.20 where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That's what Paul's answering. And you know what his answer is in short? You bet. (laughs) You get to live any way you want, child of God. But what do you want? He's going to give you a new heart. And I get to live the way I want every day because we've been set free from its dominion and its rule and reign. And for the first time in my life, I get to do what's right. Thank you, God, for this salvation. But the question that any recipient of this grace that I have preached for a year in Romans 1 through 5 will never ask, verse 1. If you've been born from above, your question isn't, can I continue in sin? How do I get out of it? I hate it. I want it rid of my life. If you sit here this morning just saying, I want more of sin. I, I, I just want more. How do I get more? Then you have not been born again. This question is not a believer's lips. This is an unbeliever attacking the gospel of, of grace. Let's just live any way we want then. Won't ever happen. And in verse 2, Paul says, Meginoitoi, perish the thought. There's no way. No way. Can you continue in sin? And his answer is, how can you who died to sin still live in it? Paul gives two reasons why this can't be. And that's what we'll look at this morning. You died to sin. And and what we're going to study is if you're visiting today, you died to its rule and reign, not its presence. It's a real reality for the believer every day. We're going to see that as we journey. You died to its complete dominion in your life. And you have been raised to walk in newness of life. It's so simple that you died to sin so that you could live to God. You can live to God, child of God. And if you remember Paul's summary in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the condemnation of mankind as you've been made for his glory, and we treasured everything else more than his glory. And we sought our own glory. We sought all these other things instead of his own glory. And I just want you to hear this. The gospel is, wait a minute, you were dead to sin. Um, You you were alive to sin and now you're dead to it. Uh, you're, You're alive to his glory. You've been made alive now. And your chief end as a believer is the glory of God. That's gotta be in your heart. I want his glory over all else. So in summary, when we'll begin, is you were alive to sin, but dead to God. And then you were brought to faith in Christ. And you died to the rule of sin. And you've been made alive to God. This gospel is not just a transaction, but it's transformational. It's going to save us from sin. Penalty, power, and presence. Oh, what a glorious gospel. And so my question this morning is, how does that take place? How does this glorious thing take place? And it's called union with Christ. And I'm going to call union a marriage. And the way that this takes place, this glorious uh, transaction, is is through a, a marriage. And you're going to hear about this the rest of the year, and I hope the rest of my life. I'm so happily married. (laughs) I love Laura, but I am the happiest married man to Jesus Christ who ever lived. The hymn writer got it right when he penned these words, come thou fount of every blessing. Christ is the fountain of every blessing. It's in him that I receive everything. So we can't make enough of Jesus Christ. You can't use hyperbole in his significance of our salvation. That is why he will be the object of our praise for all of eternity 
because we will see it in all of its fullness, not just in the mirror dimly, and we will glorify Christ forever because it's all of him. He gets all the glory. I just love that it's not about anything I do. It's, it's him. Get excited about that gospel. Dude, I've missed you. Last time you were here, you threw your notebook across the church. Welcome back. You guys be careful. Notebooks may start flying. One last thing and we'll begin. Have I said that already? Sorry. This is good though. You're going to like this. As we looked at Romans 1 through 5, did your heart ever say, let me sin that grace might abound? <coughs> Can't be. And Paul's answer is so good. You know what he says? He doesn't say, hey, remember the law. Remember the Ten Commandments. Go keep them. You can't just go live any way you want. Remember the wrath of God that you were storing up and your sin. Paul says, remember, don't you know the grace of our God? Remember the gospel. I want you to remember you died to sin and you were buried and you were raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. That's how grace works. It's so massive, it, it transforms you. Grace, you can't stay in the same relationship to sin that you had when you were in Adam. You can't have the same relationship because you were married to it before, you loved it, you served it, and you treasured it. You can't have the same relationship to sin if this grace has come into your life. So it's not a law answer, it's amazing grace. How sweet the sound. This does what the law could never do. This is what the Pharisees, they were trying to get this change and this righteousness, and they couldn't get there through law. Paul said the law just kept stirring it up. You can't run to law to fix this problem. You need to be transformed from your heart to make you a new creation. You need to be made alive to God. You are a spiritual stillborn so that you might give your members to God in service to him. So don't you dare shortchange the grace of almighty God with this ridiculous question. Let me just live in sin that I can exalt his grace. Isn't that a great answer? <laughs> grace. And in Romans 6, 14, Paul's going to say, sin will not have dominion over you because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. And for one year, I'm going to teach you how to be made holy by grace and not by law. That's my passion. That's what I'm going to be praying for. It's more powerful than law. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Outline. Paul's going to give us five truths concerning our release from the dominion of sin. And I, I want you to hold that word tightly, dominion. Not its presence, its rule. <clears throat> We're going to look at an antagonist last week, and we looked at the axiom in verse 2. So this morning, we're going to look at the third point, the argument in verses 3 through 10. The attitude is going to be so important in 6.11 that you reckon this to be true. And then our application will be, don't give your uh, members to sin to be the devil's errand boy, but a servant of God. So let's take it up, verse 1. The antagonist... What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Our axiom, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Um, I think I threw some of you last week. I, a lot of you are struggling with this concept, and I understand why, and that's why we're going to keep journeying it. <clears throat> but this is why you need midweeks or they're in here and they're discussing these questions and you're praying over them and wrestling with them together and you need mentors. You need mentors to teach you and help you understand the Word of God. In this section, you need to be mentored and shepherded through it. So if these are new and you're not getting it or understanding it, um, come seek me out and I will get you a mentor before the week is over. We got a boatload of mentors in this church. So let me bring you back to Romans 5, 12 through 21. Adam was our representative head. When he sinned, we all sinned. And we all became guilty. We were under the rule and reign of sin and its guilt and its penalty. And so this is what Paul's saying. 
You were under its, its complete rule. And when you were saved, when you came to faith, you were taken out from that realm and you were brought into this new realm of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And now you're represented by him. And so what Paul's trying to get as we begin sanctification is you're not under that rule and reign like you were when you were an unbeliever. You've been brought out from that. Don't keep living like you're in it. Don't walk around like Lazarus in your grave clothes. You've been made alive. And so he wants you to begin sanctification with, with reckoning you're not in that any longer. And that's going to be important as we journey because a lot of us live like we're still in Adam. And we believe that sin is going to rule us and reign us the rest of our days. And we've got to begin with knowing that it doesn't. You've got to reckon it to be true because it is true. It's a biblical truth. It's an indicative that we've been looking at. All right. So it says in verse 2, you died to sin. And I want you to notice one quick thing. It's in the singular. Why do you think it's not in the plural? I, I had so much sins. Why do you say we died to sin? And, in, and so here it is in 521. It says that sin reigned in death. Romans 6.6, 6, that you would no longer be slaves to sin. Romans 6.13, quit presenting your members to sin like a general in the army that you've got to serve it. 6.16 says you are a slave to sin. And 6.23, the wages of sin, it's tyranny, is death. And so I just want you to see beginning, it's, it's a rule. It's a dominion. And so let's begin to flush this out and I'll go slowly um, because of the confusion. And I want to make sure you get this because it really is important to your Christian life. So let's begin with the argument where we left off in verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? And so I like where the argument begins. Do you not know? And this is what's breaking my heart is how many don't know? America has quit preaching the word of God and it's just emotional, feel-good stuff and we don't know. We don't know how to live in light of these truths and these realities. Paul's assuming it. He's, he's going to say, go back to your baptism. You know when that is? That's the beginning of your Christian life. He's saying, don't you know the, the basics of what your baptism pictured? And you pictured that you died to sin and you were raised to walk in newness of life. Or do you not know? <laughs> Don't you know it? And Paul's going to work out this truth. Again, it's an indicative. Indicatives is, is a statement of fact. What's done and imperative is what you must do. So hear this. This is what God did at salvation. You don't have to go do it. I know more people trying to put to death their old man, what they were in Adam, and you're not called to do that. God did it. It's done. It's an heiress. It's finished. So you have to know and what is more, you have to reckon it. How many of you got up this week and said, I've died to sin? And got up with a whole new mindset, the victor's mindset versus the Eeyore mindset. Woe is me, I'm going to sin all day again. Okay? Wake up with that victor mindset. And Paul is saying this is the foundation stone of Christian living. And he says, don't you know it? But pastor, I don't like to think. I'm a feeler. I'm a lover. No, you're not if you don't think. Sanctification, Paul says, begins in the mind to the heart. Don't you know that this truth will touch your affections and your will? But you have to know Romans 1 through 5, that great gospel. And now you've got to know in chapter 6 that this is what is done for you as a child of God. And so hear this. We got to work hard in this text to understand it. Okay, there's some hard things. Romans 6, 6 says you died to your old man. So then what is that? Why do I still battle sin? What, what, what is normal? What isn't normal? What do I put to death? What, what's already been put to death? There's just a lot of questions that we're going to have to journey and we're going to have to think. And we just live in the day of sound bites and blogs and, and we don't work out thoughts anymore. And Paul's working out deep thoughts that he believes are foundational to the Christian life. So I need you to work hard to understand this. This is going to matter to your Christian life. I, I, I just met more people this week. I just want a simple illustration. <laughs> Give me just a little soundbite. That's all I need. Quit wasting my, my Sundays. 
And I, I've, got, I've heard a bunch of them. And they don't cover it. And this will take work and study and prayer and meditation. Don't you know? How can you reckon it if you don't understand it? And so the possibilities with understanding this for your Christian life are amazing. And I want you to come with me on this beautiful journey. And my prayer at the end of this section is that everyone can answer this question, don't you know, with a big yes. Let's look at it. Don't you know? Knowing, this is interesting, it's an experiential kind of knowledge. So I want you to catch this. This isn't just getting book smart. This is learning the Word of God, and it's experiential that the dominion of sin has been broken in my life. And I'm, and I'm learning, and I'm seeing these things. And so it's not just um, believe what isn't true. It's know what is true. And there, there should be some experiential in every one of you saying, yeah. I mean, what is every baptism here? This is what I was, and this is what I am. There, there needs to be some experiential knowledge and what we're looking at. So you need to understand it academically, but it's an experiential. This is me. This is my testimony. So I pray for every believer this morning that we're reading your testimony when you got in the waters of baptism. So this is the key to the argument, union with Christ. And so we don't, here's so important to me, you don't just get a representative head whose actions represent us. So with Adam, I, he represented me, and when he sinned, I sinned. But I, I don't even know the guy. Have any of you met Adam? I have no relationship with him. There's nothing there. But the second Adam, much more. I don't only really get what he did, his obedience and his death, but I get him. Thank you. I don't want just his, his work. I mean, I'll take that. I like it. But I get him. I get married to the second Adam. That's the whole Christian life. I get married to Jesus by faith. And then and I'm in a spiritual union now, in a oneness, an organic union with the Son of God by the Holy Spirit of God. I am married to Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Galatians 3, 27, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so don't you know this, that you get Christ by faith and all that he is, all that he's done, and all that he can be for you this very morning. And Romans 7, 4, it says a marriage takes place. Um, you, you attend your own funeral when you believe and you attend your marriage. Not bad. Marriage and death don't usually go together. Well, for some of you it does. <laughs> So it's not like a physical marriage where men are courting their women and bringing flowers and gifts and doing nice things. Guys, you are the bride from hell. You were the bag lady in Romans 1 through 3. And Christ sought you when you were a stranger wandering from the fold of God. And he washed you and he cleansed you and he married you. And he took you out from the rule and realm of sin. And he brought you into his kingdom to sit at his table with all the privileges of marriage. In order that, you might bear fruit for God in the newness of life in this relationship. And now I forsake all others, keeping myself only unto him, whether I have sickness or health or joy and sorrows, I give myself to him. Am I now going to live in what he hates? Am I going to hold his hand with my left hand and iniquity with my right? The one who hates sin more than I ever could, who I love more than anyone else, am I going to treasure that, still live in that in the same way as when I didn't know him? If, if my bride, Mrs. Murphy, who I love with all my heart, let's just, this is an example, it's not true. Let's say she had a strong allergy to my cologne. I had this bad cologne in high school when we met. It's called Night Pasture, and it smelled so bad. I made that up. It was, it was, it was actually smelled pretty good. But let's say she almost dies from my cologne, 
And we, we go to the hospital and they give her a medication and it barely restores her and saves her life. Am I going to just keep wearing the cologne to exalt the remedy? The sin that killed my Savior and my own soul so I still hold it? How can you who died to sin still live in it? You've been brought into a new realm. Don't you know? Well, what do I get by being joined to Christ? What does that do to sin? I'm really glad you asked. It brings about a death. It brings about a burial. And it brings about a resurrection. And what do you think would be a good way to picture that? You can throw it out there if you want to yell it. What would be a good picture of a death, burial, and resurrection? Symbolically. Who said that? Say it louder. Baptism. Steve Hare, my brother. He was in my college group 30 years ago. That's sweet. Baptism. Paul's whole argument is going to now be wrapped up this morning in baptism. And I want you to say, as we begin, there's much debate. Any life-changing truth, there's always debate. And this is where people hold to what's called baptismal regeneration. You get baptized and that saves you. And there's whole cults and religions that teach that. It's heresy. Throughout the whole book of Romans, we've spent a year learning the gospel and it's by faith, not by works. And now Paul's going to come to chapter 6, just get baptized and get saved. It's just foolish. Can't be it. But the question is, is it, is it water baptism or is it the Spirit's baptism when the Spirit joins you into this union with Jesus Christ? And so there's a lot of debate on that. So which is it? Raise your hand if you think it's water baptism. Raise your hand if you think it's the Spirit's baptism. Raise your hand if you don't know. That's not good that I don't know. Here's my answer. As radio once said, both. Both. So which is it? Well, 20 years ago I preached this and I told you there's not a drop of water in this passage. Just the Spirit's baptizing. And this morning, I think this passage is full of water. There's enough to immerse you in it this morning. Uh, I'm going to dunk you in it. Okay? You're going to have donuts afterwards, like we do here. And I know some of you have a MacArthur study Bible on your lap right now and you're going to throw the flag 15 yards because he says it's, it's, there's no water in it. Okay? Study Bibles. Um, the Bible is inspired but the, the notes of the human art. I just wanted to share that with you just in case you didn't know that. Okay? <laughs> so don't get mad at me. To put everyone at rest, there's only one heretical view. Baptismal regeneration. But we all believe in salvation by faith in Christ alone. We all believe in the Spirit's baptism. You are joined in a mystical union to Jesus Christ by faith. We all believe that the Spirit's baptism is what causes us to have died to sin. It's a spiritual reality. Where that is in this passage, no doubt. But let me try to explain my thinking. Come to me to verse 3. <clears throat> or do you not know... That all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So let's start with water baptism. What is water baptism? It's a declaration of faith. It's pledging your allegiance to Christ from 1 Peter. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience. I'm testifying that I want to walk in obedience to Christ. It's identifying with Jesus Christ. I'm going public. This is my Savior and my Lord. And I'm unashamed of it. And it's also a very dramatic picture or portrayal of what took place spiritually when you believed in Christ, which is the text before us. Throughout the book of Acts, you believed and you were baptized. And really, the rite of initiation into the Christian life was baptism. Baptism was one confessing Christ and following him 
an unbaptized Christian just didn't happen in the New Testament. <laughs> they believed, they were baptized, and they were brought into the church. And so quite simply, baptism was a sign. It's a sacrament that signifies something. And it's that of our union with Christ. Our salvation that you were joined to the second Adam. And so I heard this illustration recently. What is this? Can't hear you. Oh, I took it off my finger. It was right here, and it's kind of round. What is this? Okay, so this is what I've learned in my journey, and I'm sorry if, if you yelled out differently. The guys say it's a ring, and the girls say it's a wedding ring. I don't know why, but it's just what happens. But what it is, it's a symbol of the whole marriage covenant of the vow that I made on that altar with my wife. So if I take it off, am I still married? Yeah. Let's say I walk over and give it to Marty. Is Marty married to Laura then? No. The ring is just a sign and a symbol of the thing signified. And so in our passage, baptism stands for the thing signified, that spiritual union with Christ, being baptized into him. Peter said, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. It's just a sign of repentance and faith and joining. The scriptures declare that all of us were baptized into Jesus Christ when we believed. The minute you believe, every believer is baptized into Christ. Spiritually, you're joined to him. And so my baptism is a sign of my identification with him, but also, get this, my incorporation with him. My, by faith, I've been joined to him. His history is now my history. Everything that Christ did is now as if I did it. It's reckoned to me. God looks at me as if I lived the life Jesus Christ lived. I'm accepted. He looks at me as if I died on a cross for my sin. His justice is satisfied. Please hear this then. When you believed and when you were baptized, we get all of Christ. We get all of Christ. You're joined to him. And I just want you to hear this. It's all ours. No one gets more access to Christ than anyone else. Isn't that beautiful? Every one of you have full access to Christ. No one gets more of his work. You get all of his work because you're joined to him. No one gets more of his righteousness. You're joined to it and it's yours. Man, I caught that light with my eye. That was bad. Give me a second to see again. We all get him in all of his fullness. He's yours. There aren't super saints. Everybody gets this. There are no second blessings. There's not some higher life. Faith gets you all of the life and death of Jesus Christ. I'm baptized into him. I get him. It's the glory of the Christian. I get Jesus Christ in a spiritual union of marriage. Or do you not know that? I meet more people living the Christian life without Jesus. You've missed something. <laughs> something really important. It can't be done. You get Jesus. And the Christian life is living into this union like a vine and a branch. And grace is going to bear fruit from that relationship. You get all of Christ. Believer, believer in Christ this morning, you have all of them. You don't get a little portion. Do you remember that little lady? Uh, she was a Gentile saying, I just want a crumb from the table. You know, that's, I, sometimes I just feel like all I get is crumbs. I get all of Christ. All of them. All right, that's your introduction. You like it? <laughs> so let's look at our, our three aspects of what Christ that we are baptized into, and I'll do these quickly. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. So you're joined to him, and Paul's going to say, this is what you get, and here's what baptism pictures. Verse 3. You not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. Verse 3. <coughs> verse 5 says his death. Verse 6 says you died. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. When you are joined to Christ... You are joined to his death. So what happened to Christ? 
The word became flesh. He stepped out of glory into the jurisdiction and realm of sin. In glory, there was no realm of sin. He came in, he felt its power. He resisted to the point of shedding blood, Hebrews says. He was beaten in this realm by sin, sinful people more than any other. He was tempted beyond any of us, but he never gave in. So none of us even know to what degree he was tempted because we give. He wept over Lazarus' tomb, the fruit of sin. At the end of his days, it was all put upon his back, sin. And he, he, our, our sorrows, he, he himself carried. He felt the weight of sin as the Father poured out his full wrath on the cross. He died in our stead for sin. And Romans 6.10 says he paid it once for all. And so in the same way that Jesus is done with sin, we are done with its dominion. We died to it. And all of us believers are baptized into this once and for all, a death to sin. We're joined to Christ and we died to the rule in the realm of sin. Colossians 3.3, 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So at salvation, you attend your own funeral. It's as if you go back 2,000 years and you were crucified on that cross. And when you believe, you were joined to Christ and it was applied to you, that death that took place 2,000 years ago. And you die to this realm and rule, my dear brethren. You've died to it. You've been brought out of it. This is not sinless perfection, but a new direction. It's a new heart and a new desire, a new realm uh, this already not yet aspect of salvation. But please hear this. You are no longer under the condemnation of sin. And you are no longer under the dominion of sin. And you can't begin living the Christian life until you settle that. You are not under its condemnation. You are not under its power. But you still have its presence on a daily basis. And as we journey, I believe you're going to feel that that presence, the more holy you get, the more you're going to feel its resistance. We have a traitor within, temptations without, and a crafty devil. You still feel its effects, but not its rule. Or do you not know? Second thing in verse 4, therefore we've been buried with him through baptism into his death. Paul doesn't just rush into resurrection he goes to burial. Why? What's a burial? Well, a burial is the final proof of death. It's its finality. It's truly the final evidence that there's been a death. A burial really shows that you're done with the state and condition that you were in before. You're finished entirely and completely with your relationship to this life when you die and you're buried. So Christ was buried to the realm of sin. It was finished. And he's going to come back, it says, without reference to sin. He's done with it. He made redemption. He was done with the realm of sin. So I want you to hear this. In baptism, so to speak, we go into a watery grave. And we go under the water. And you're entombed with Christ. That's what you're picturing. And you've been buried. And whenever I baptize you, I say, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the next thing I say is buried with Christ in baptism. You go in and you're entombed and you've been buried. And what you were in Adam died. Baptism is a beautiful picture of what it means to be joined to Christ. And we should treasure them. Every time there's a baptism, you should do everything you can to come see it and come be a part of it and celebrate such a beautiful thing. And never get over what these baptisms picture. I love baptisms. It's why we do water baptism here at this church. And it's why we do believers baptism. Because there needs to be faith and repentance because you've got to be joined to Christ. So we don't baptize infants. We baptize believers. And we put you buried with Christ in this tomb Boom. Raised to walk in newness of life. And that's why we have you share your testimony. As to every testimony I've ever heard here, hundreds, I died. 
Here's what I was in Adam. Here's how Christ saved me. Here's who I am now. And every, every one of you get in there and just say, I'm just new. I'm different. I'm not what I was in Adam. That's every testimony I've ever heard in our baptismal water. That's the picture. It's a glorious, don't you know? So what about us? Well, we all went into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. We were put in grave clothes and embalmed. A sepulcher was placed upon it. And we died to sin. And when we were buried, we were entirely finished with this rule and reign of sin that had us when we were in Adam. And to go back to the reign of sin with complete domination would be like digging up a dead body. It's buried. It's dead. You're done with that rule. And Ram, do you see the foolishness of this question? Let me just continue in sin that grace might. I pray that some of your hearts are just looking at sin right now, saying, I hate it. Why am I going back? Why am I going back into that stuff? I'm done with that realm and that rule. And I, I get to close with my favorite part resurrection. Hinna clause, which is a purpose. We were joined also to his resurrection. God did not leave Christ buried. Sin and death, the devil wanted to keep him in the ground. But it says in our verse, through the glory of the Father, Acts 2.24, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. We've learned in Adam, death was a tremendous power. It got all of us and it ruled and reigned us. Sin and death thought they got Jesus. And here comes the omnipotent power and he's raised. And the reign of death is broken and the reign of sin has been broken as he was raised up. Christ finally and completely conquered sin and its rule. All sin can do now is kill us and bury us. But it has no further power. In Christ, there's resurrection. My daddy is sitting at the presence of Jesus Christ here this morning. Because of Jesus Christ broke that realm. So his resurrection proclaims and establishes that he is finished with sin. He's seated at the right hand of God in victory. And that work is finished. And so Christ was resurrected into a new realm. And so we too are resurrected into a new realm. And Paul calls it grace. We are now brought into a new ruler, a new reign. And I love this master. And his name is Jesus Christ. And this resurrection brings newness of life. And so this 33 years when Jesus was on earth was a temporary realm. Christ entered it to save his people from their sin, the guilt and tyranny and even its presence. And he has died and he's gone out of its realm and its jurisdiction forever. And so you too as well. So what is true of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection then is true of us. The same power that raised Jesus Christ has raised us to life. Ephesians 2, 6, it raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are seated in the heavenly places this morning, positionally, in Christ Jesus. We are no longer in the rule and reign of sin. We are taken out of Adam. We are put in Christ. Died, buried, and raised. And we are placed in the reign of grace. And Philippians 1, 6 now says, this reign... He who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. And he is going to conform us into the image of Christ. He will finish that work and we will be glorified. You cannot continue in sin the same way as when you were in Adam. What went into that grave is totally different than what came out. And when I lift you out of that water, what do I say? Raised to walk in newness of life. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have gone, and behold, new things have come. It's all new. 
a dead soul made alive, a new world and life view, new motives that want to please God, new emotions, love and joy and peace, new possessions. I possess everything in Christ, a new covenant, new song, new strength, new spirit, new heart, new self, newness. Raised to walk in newness of life. So don't miss this. Salvation makes all things new. We can't continue to live in the same way. Reckon this to be true. Reckon this to be true this morning. And I want to close with that old spiritual hymn. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yes, I was. Were you there when they laid him in a tomb? Yes, I was. And were you there when he rose up from the grave? Yes, I was. Don't you feel like shouting glory, glory? I'd sing it, but you guys would hate me for it. <laughs> glory. So my application is, do you not know? Do you think of yourself this way? Most walk around saying I'm alive to sin. I'm a slave. I have to do it. There's a whole system called 12 steps. And that whole system says that you need to admit the rest of your life that you're an alcoholic. That denies everything of Romans 6. I've had some of you say, my whole family's angry. It's just a trait. I got to be angry. I'm a workaholic. That's what my dad taught me. I'm a sex addict. And I want you to hear the gospel this morning. You died to that ruling realm. And you were buried. And you've been raised to walk in newness of life. And Paul says, such were some of you. You're not that anymore. And the Christian life begins with acknowledging I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a sex addict. I'm not a food addict. I'm not an entertainment addict or self-glory addict. I'm a new creation. And I've been raised to walk in newness. Isn't that the best news you could ever hear? If you're sitting here with any addiction, the gospel of Jesus Christ can set you free from it. And understanding Romans 6 is where you need to go. So if you're battling something that you feel is addiction or dominion, I want you to seek out one of your elders or just one of the leaders, one of the, anyone who could help you in this church afterwards. Because you, you, need, you, need, you can't live in that and believe that any longer. It's a lie. It's the devil's lie. He loves that word addiction so you can stay in it your whole life. But it's not God's word. <laughs> you, you're not that. You've been set free from that rule and reign. And so... I have something better for you this morning than Ten Commandments. If I just told you, go out of here and quit being addicted to sin, what a nasty thing that would be to do to you. Many churches send you out, go conquer sin. John Bunyan, one of my favorites, wrote Pilgrim's Progress. He said, to run and work, the law commands, but gives neither feet nor hands. But better news the gospel brings it bids us fly and gives us wings. This gospel is a gospel of freedom. To be set free from the dominion of sin. And then we're going to be one day set free from its presence. But we're going to journey Romans and learn how to fight remaining sin. But not reigning sin. And so my charge is get out there. To a world that's lost in sin and its control and its addictions and I want you to have compassion and I want you to go love them and meet them and get in their lives because we have the answer and it's not a moral cleanup. Every answer the world has is just morally clean up and that's not a remedy. I have Jesus Christ and if you'll repent and come to him, you'll die and be buried and raised to walk in newness of life. We have the best message there's ever been for sinners. Get out there. Go get a look this week. Go say something. Go. Tell them of the glorious grace of Almighty God. All right, I'll shut up. I could go on for hours because it's just, I love Romans 6 and I've studied it too long. I, I should probably just 
you, you, know, you guys want to do that one Sunday? Let's go five hours. Bring your lunches. We'll have a break every hour and we could finish a whole chapter. Okay, let's do it. I got enough nods that I think you all said yes. <laughs> let's pray. Father, my heart overflows with a good thing. I love this gospel. I love that the penalty of sin has been dealt with. And the way you dealt with it was in your own son. Keeping a law I could never keep. And dying the death that I deserve for countless and endless sin against you. How could I stand not guilty, blameless, loved and accepted and now adopted? That isn't enough, God, to take me out of the rule and reign of the first Adam. Sin held my, he held me. I loved it. I served it so doulos, so happily. God, this gospel breaks it. And the way you break it through Jesus Christ broke my heart. And it broke the dominion of sin because all I want to do now is love this king and give my members to serve him and make much of him with the rest of the days that we have. And every one of us who are believers grieve with the remaining sin that fights that. It keeps us from doing that, that longing. God, I just there's such a battle within us. We, we groan for the redemption. Come, Lord Jesus, and finish the final not yet where we will no longer have any sin in these bodies ever again battling us. No devil, no world. God, what a beautiful finish line it's going to be. So we thank you for that. And I pray for any in our midst who have held the lie, who have held the lie that they're okay while they're under the dominion of sin. There's a Savior from that. And it's not the law. It's not resolutions. It's not 12 steps. It's not working harder. Be better Christian. It's a Savior who says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest for your souls. Oh God, let many come this morning and find this glorious rest that you offer that will give them a death and a burial and a resurrection to walk in newness of life. Oh God, let us know this. And as we journey, let us reckon it to be true of us and to set us free in a whole new way to go fight against sin. God, I love these saints, and I pray, meet them in a special way. And help them, I pray. Amen.